This is not a passive relationship. I'm sorry if I'm going to burst any bubbles today, but God did not get you saved to just let you sit there until your days are done. If God's only purpose for your life, and I may get it loud a couple times today, hallelujah, but if God intended to simply get you saved, he would have got you saved and taken you up to heaven immediately. So are we all still here? So why are we here? Why are we here? Who are we? Who are we? Well, I want to read something to you. Uh, I believe the words of Jesus are the most important thing. <clears throat> and we'll have the scripture on it. You know, and you might even want to, you might even want to close your eyes if you want, because this is actually a very precious passage. It's the first teaching of Jesus to his disciples. The first of five discourses in Matthew, who believes the first things are important? Yeah, first things. Okay, so if you want, if it helps you to concentrate, you can close your eyes. Nobody will worry about that. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 1 to 16. We're going to focus on 13 to 16 today, but I would like to read the first of the chapter because I always believe it's important to take scripture in context. Please never take one verse and just preach it around and talk about it and just think that that's the only thing. Please read and study and learn it in context because there's going to be more things around it, right? That give more revelation. Okay. So Matthew 5. We all know this passage, but I think I'm going to talk about something today that maybe we haven't focused on very much. After seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the very first time it tells us that he's, he may have done it before, but I believe this is likely the first recorded um, time that all these people came. But it says that he sat down with his disciples. So I'm thinking they were off to the side a little bit. And they gathered around and he began to teach them and this is what he told them. So he is speaking to his disciples. Not the crowd. 
and he proceeded to tell them when they would be blessed. And the list is a little, uh, you know, doesn't really talk about riches and they're gonna have fine houses and <laughs> it's gonna be so exciting following me because we will have groupies and roadies and <laughs> trucks and microphones and we're gonna go on the road, guys. It's gonna be great. And then who does he tell them they are? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a princess, I'm a queen. You know, tell me something good. I want to feel good about your salt. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Okay, that's good. Thanks, Jesus. I'm just the salt of the earth. Honestly, we used to say that he's just the salt of the earth. <laughs> Do we ever really think about that or talk about it? Well, if you didn't, that's okay. I never did. <laughs> this is why I'm, we're talking about it today. I want to talk a little about some properties of salt. Because Jesus said that's who we were, the salt of the earth. All right. Strap in. I, wanna, I just want to also see, read from the Living Bible. I'm sorry for those of you you know, I'm, we're not talking about translations today. Um, <clears throat> the Living Bible. <laughs> you are the world's seasoning to make it tolerable. If you lose your flavor, what will happen to the world? And you yourselves will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Ow. The message says, let me tell you why you are here. Yeah. He had their attention. Yeah. You're here to be salt, seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Yeah. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Wow. You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. I didn't write it. <laughs> Who is discouraged by the brokenness, at times discouraged, saddened, maybe even in despair of the brokenness you see around you? How many wonder what is going on in the world? How many of us can be brokenhearted? Well, there's an antidote. Us. Let's talk a little bit about salt. Kind of an interesting analogy, right? So if Jesus said it, it must have importance. Everything that Jesus said, everything that God said is very important. Please do not take it lightly and think they're just making something up to fill the pages. I apologize. Is that a little too much? Too much? I love I love Pastor Charlotte. Her and I have we're kind of similar. Um, <clears throat> so then what was salt to them? So this is some thousands of years ago. So I understand maybe today he would talk about smartphones or PDAs or devices or something that we would think are valuable. <clears throat> salt was used as a form of payment. The word salary comes from salt. They didn't have money. Like they were beginning to mine for money and make coins and, and, and legal forms of tender. But before that, I believe the Phoenicians were some of the first. They used salt to pay. Like you, the, the man worked a day and he got paid in salt. It was so valuable to them. Why? It doesn't grow on trees. You have to either mine it out of the ground or dehydrate it from water. And do you know that it's the one thing the body does not produce that you will die without? You will die without salt. But your body doesn't make it. <laughs> kind of bizarre. Fun facts. <clears throat> what does the salt do? Before there was refrigeration, what did we do? We preserve food. I mean, some people still today, right? Anyone make sausage or jerky or... Uh, 
things like that, you know, you use salt. You need to dry it out and you need to use salt, but all in the right proportion, right? So it preserves. You're following me, right? Because I know you're all really, really quick. You're all going to really get this. You're going to see the connection. It disinfects. I know there's doctors in the house. What's the first thing we do? You get a boo-boo. Let's clean it with some saline solution. Nice and simple. Doesn't really harm the body. It's just natural, right? Because we, we are like a saline, big bag of saline solution, <laughs> kind of, right? I'm obviously not a doctor. I'll just do a disclaimer right there. I don't think that surprised any of you. <clears throat> My <laughs> it seasons. It adds value. It provided employment. Again, you had to mine it. You had to ship it. You had to put it in bags. You had to do things with it. It was very valuable to them. Okay, so Jesus has never taken the third or fourth or fifth best thing and say, well, it's kind of like this, but you're not really so super great. Like, you're not really very good, but I'll just liken it to this sort of thing. No. Jesus is always, this is really important, and you're very valuable. They would have gotten this. They would have understood it. It improves life. Now, salt doesn't change the flavor. If your meal is lacking a little flavor and you want to season it with some salt, do your potatoes start tasting like peas? No. They just taste better. Okay, you're following me. Adding salt improves the flavor. What happens if you use too much? Oh, really bad. So funny story, um, I have children, I won't tell you how old they are because then you do some quick math and we're not having any of that. Um, <laughs> so I used to, I was fairly, you know, traditional, we, you know, I baked and I cooked and, you know, I baked cookies and all these things and, and I learned, uh, pro mom tip number one, <laughs> if you don't want to take too long to make cookies, that's you have to, I'm consuming that one after the other. Uh, you just put all the chocolate chip cookie dough in a pan. Who has done that? Chocolate chip cookie bars, hello, right? Super easy. You can even melt the chocolate chips on top at the end and cut them into bars. And they're like, woohoo, like your squares. And you're like, yeah, that came from Miss, Miss Love's Bakery. Um, but, but I'm, I was kind of a, I won't use the word lazy. That's a terrible word. Um, time frugal baker. And um, so it takes a lot of time to like measure out. And so sometimes I would just like, you know, uh, well, on this one occasion, my son and his best friend were over and like, mom, we love those cookie bars. Can we make them? Like there was learning to cook. I was encouraged to make your own stuff. What do you think I'm here to say? No, I mean, I was encouraging. <laughs> right. No, it was that the school, you know, was teaching uh, home ec or something. Oh, darn, that's a long time ago. Sorry, that was too far. Um, <laughs> so I had the salt, and I held it over the mixing bowl to, to measure wrong. Everyone knows you, like, measure over here, and then add the ingredients into the bowl. And I was in a bit of a rush, like, Mom, help us out. So I'm like... I think, I don't know what happened. I think I was going to shake it in my hand. Do you ever do that? Shake the thing in your hand and then like a pinch. The, the recipes always say a pinch or two. Put it, well, the lid came off the salt <laughs> and dumped right into the bowl. And the boys were like, oh, and I'm so frugal. I tried to like take the salt out and took out as much, you know, because it's right there. And I was like, they're like, we don't think this is a good idea, mom. And anyways, so I, we tried to salvage it, tried to take out some of the dough, put it in the pan and cooked it. And the boys, uh, bless their hearts, it was really salty. <laughs> so, so the boys were like, well, <laughs> they, were, they were, had real senses of humor. So they, they called them something like uh, Kendra's water retaining bars. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't do that. So too much salt is bad. We know that, okay? Too much salt. If you're on some kind of diet, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm just saying, too much salt is not good. So seasoning, what would that mean? That we would be seasoning wherever we go, right? That we would improve the flavor of things. We would preserve. We would help bring a cleansing. 
We, we are to be what is right with the world, God's kids, right? Yeah, okay. So then there's this interesting little passage. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Hmm. Well, they had lots of salt there at the temple for the food, for the sacrifice, right? It was part of their, um, I'm not an expert, but it was part of the ceremony. There was the salt sacrifice or something else. I'm sure I'll be schooled later by someone who knows more about that. But there was salt there. And the salt only lasted so long. You know, they would, they would bring it, but it didn't last forever there. So what did they do when the salt wasn't salty anymore or it had been used somehow? They would throw it out on the walkway for traction. They would just, ah, this old salt. Don't taste good no more. Just throw it out. There's going to be a right level of seasoning in our lives. There's going to be a correct balance in our lives, in our words, in our behavior. <clears throat> the correct amount is perfect. I had someone say once, uh, well, we're to be salty with the world, salty, just as if we have got to correct them and judge them. And so Jesus didn't ask us to get rid of sin. Whoa, who's getting that? Jesus does not call us to eradicate sin. Okay? Now, we may see a brother or sister. Now, we're only allowed to do that with others that are part of God's family. If we see a brother or sister, um, and they are really, really in sin, and it's clear we need to follow biblical principles, but there may be that Holy Spirit, we've come alongside them, and there may be a correction because we're holding each other accountable, okay? But we don't judge the world. Christ judges the world, okay? So there's sin and there's brokenness, but it's his job to deal with it. And guess what he has? Christ has redeemed the world, Already, past tense, all the world stands redeemed. Maybe we've not accepted the gift yet, but he's done it. He has conquered sin, death, and the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we don't, we were like, oh, the sin and the, yeah. Jesus is like, I dealt with it on the cross. I ask you to accept my gift of salvation, walk in healing, repentance, forgiveness, get healed, and go out and share it with others. We're not fighting. There's terrible sins. At the center, we have people who come to us who are really struggling with a lot of things. But we just see a person in front of us and we love them. That's what Jesus did. He loved people one at a time. And prove it for yourself. You look up every interaction Jesus had with people to see how he approached them. Usually, often they approached him first. You say, you are really... Stupid, you're, do you know what you're doing? You're like so bad. You have done every horrible thing and you're a really awful person. You're a really, really terrible person. You are a real sinner. And the people would have been like, yeah, that's kind of why I came to you because I heard you heal people. He knew them though. He always knew them. He says, I see you, I know you, and I love you. And we're to imitate Christ. Yep. We're to imitate Christ. Okay, so why are we at, do need, we need to watch our conversation and watch how we approach people who do not know Jesus yet because we are his ambassadors? They will assume that when we, that because we say we're his representatives, that we are talking and thinking and acting the way Jesus would. Yeah, that's 
right? So if they have a wrong idea of Jesus, could it be that it's maybe not Jesus' fault? Could it be that people do not represent Jesus correctly? Think we need to own that? Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. (laughs) Would Paul be advocating that everything that comes out of our mouth is is critical and judgy and rude and sharp and ow, like ow. No, it will be, uh, the flavor will be improved. It will bring life. It will taste good. Jesus had this way of identifying the person's problem in such a a kind way that they're like, yeah, that's, that's really me. That's really my problem. I get it. He says, I know this about you. Go and don't do that anymore. (laughs) Could we imitate Jesus by our speech? He also says that we are light. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Wow. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the Living Bible, it says you are the world's light. A city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light. Let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see so that they will praise your heavenly Father. A few years ago when I was first studying this passage... I'm like, okay, what what does that mean? A light on a hill, and I got this vision. So again, these these are ancient peoples, okay? So he's using analogy that they will understand. So I got this vision of of a traveler on the road, and and this is a desert area, right? The wilderness, they have these well-marked trails and roads, and they need to get to the next town or city. Well, how would they, they don't have a smartphone with GPS, so there's probably only certain roads they know which roads to take, but could you imagine their delight that if you're walking through the wilderness and you see the lights of a town or a city and how it glows, and you're like, oh, that, that's where I'm going. I'm almost there, I'm almost there. And it's a beacon, a beacon to follow. You see it there. but. To create a glow, does does one flashlight create much of a glow? You're going to need a few lights. A city is not one light. A city references many lights, many homes, many lanterns, many candles. One grain of salt is not going to do very much. You can all go home and try it. Take one one grain out of the salt shaker. And just, there you go. But, but a whole shaker full, right? A whole container full. One little light maybe doesn't light up that much. It's going to light the area right around it, and that's great. But all together, they, we make a city glowing on a hill that would welcome people to come to us. So if people are drawn to us, and then we say, uh, yeah, no, we meant the other people. We're not really so sure about you. So light doesn't actually destroy darkness. Like, it, it dispels it. The dark is there. But as long as the light is, it has overcome the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome the light that is God. So we need to understand how to walk in that. We talk about, oh, the darkness in the world and the darkness. So we are the light. We'll say it together. We are the light of the world. Wow. Wow. How bright do we shine? 
Are we making a difference? With light, light makes colors visible. Light also disinfects, right? You can use UV light now. They can pass water, pass UV lights to kill all the bad stuff in the water. Oh, <laughs> Jesus knew that. <laughs> when, when light passes through water, we get rainbows. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it dispels shadows. Light makes it impossible to hide anything. I learned that when I moved recently because I often think I'm being thrifty by not having all the lights on full blast all the time, you know, ambiance and everything. And then when you turn them on, um, then you need to sweep. <laughs> and when the same boat, no, you don't have to put your hand up, it's okay. I'll take the hit for everyone. So just turn the light on once in a while is all I'm saying. It's just good. Pro tip number two. But, but the darkness can't hide. The darkness can't be present where there's light. Yeah. And who is light? John 1, 1 to 9. I won't read the whole thing. I, lo I love it, but I'll just pick out a couple of these verses. John 1 and verse 4. It's talking about Jesus being the word in the beginning. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. <clears throat> in, in the New, uh, New Living Translation, it says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The darkness that is in the world is defeated. It has been defeated. God has, Jesus Christ has overcome death, hell, and the grave. For now we still live in this fallen world. But in the kingdom, and I love every song this morning was so appropriate. It was amazing. The kingdom of God is Righteousness, peace, and joy. And what is the kingdom? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom? Where the king lives, king is his domain. D-O-M. The dominion of the king is the kingdom. We are living in Jesus' kingdom. Or he should be our king. Because then we are under the domain of the king and everything he produces is good. Righteousness, peace, and joy. <clears throat> Why did Jesus say he came? Why did Jesus come to the earth? Yeah, to save. I love Luke 4, 18. I love it. So Jesus gets up. This is just amazing. He gets up in the synagogue. And what did he say? The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Luke 4, 18. And it is from Isaiah 51. He is reading the... Again, they did not have the New Testament. So they read the Old Testament. That's what they had. Jesus, I believe, had all of this memorized. <clears throat> the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. In the New King James, let's just put that back at the beginning, if, if you would. I have it. In, um, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
That was his whole purpose. Jesus said, this thief does not come but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they would have life and have it abundantly to the full. Okay, so, so we're saved. The spirit gets saved, the flesh does not. Oh, we sang, was this not glorious this morning? We sang over and over, it is well with my soul. What is the soul? The mind, the will, and emotions. This is where the battleground is. So Jesus' whole plan, he came to heal, to deliver, to set free, to save. How does he do that? He's gone. Actually, FYI, right? He came, he had a ministry, was crucified, resurrected. He says, I need to go away, but it is good that I go away because when I go away to my father, I'm going to send you Oh, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Uh, comes from the word paraclete, which means like a helper, a guide, a friend. I had a pastor preach once. It's like the Holy Spirit comes up to us, grabs our arm and throws it over his shoulder. And is like, okay. He's the helper, the comforter. I've heard someone say he's the comforter because we're supposed to be uncomfortable. Are we going to be uncomfortable? <laughs> Who here has had a lot of comfort? So Jesus as a man could not be everywhere all the time, but Holy Spirit can. So first the disciples needed to get this. So we get saved, but some of us have not appropriated our healing. So it's hard to heal others before we've been healed. So first, Jesus wants to heal us, heal our broken hearts. Anyone has had a broken heart? Anyone has felt like a captive or, or being a captive to anything and bondage to anything? I've had a few hard things happen in my life. Some of them, and I don't know probably any of your stories, but I gather we've all had difficult things. Some of us have had so many difficult things, so hard, that we, we despaired of surviving. That's the reality of existence here on this earth. And Jesus knew that. You see, there isn't going to be an end to the heart. Oh, man, I'm really sorry. This is, okay, so this is the little sad part. This isn't the happy part. So, listen, he said in this world, you will have trouble. You'll have tribulation. You'll have trials and sorrows. The people that we work with at the Pregnancy Care Center, um, so we work with women and men. The majority might come to us because they think they might be pregnant um, or have had... Uh, a loss in their past, a, a, a pregnancy has been terminated, and they've, they're struggling with grief around that. Some have been raped or assaulted, kicked out of their home. Let me just say that it, that it's all simple on the earth until there's people involved. <laughs> and, and our sexuality is probably one of the most complicated things out there. The enemy knows this. And so he uses it to, again, destroy our identity. If we can live in shame because of our behaviors and our choices, we're always going to feel and live in shame. We're going to allow that condemnation to become part of who we are. And it's going to be really hard for us to truly believe that Jesus loves and accepts us till our heart is healed. So that's why Jesus said, I came to heal. I came to heal and set free and deliver. And we probably... Maybe everyone will wake up. I need to say something really important. Because we need to love others, he says, if you love me and you love my father, you will do what I do. If you say you have not love but do not obey me, you do not love. So in order for us to love others, we need to know that we have been loved. 
If we are having a hard time loving others, maybe we have not appropriated all of Jesus' love for us. And I'm saying that because I know in my life, I had hardship and dysfunction right from childhood, and I never really 100% believed that, yes, God loved me. And until I could really say that and walk in it and believe it, I was easily offended. I could be overly critical. I saw all the things wrong in everybody else, but had a very hard time identifying them in my own life. And I always felt like if they only knew who I really was, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't like me because I'm not very likable, which is a lie. Satan's the father of lies. He just keeps whispering things in our ear and we think they're thoughts. Please don't think the thoughts. You don't have to think the thoughts. Please take them captive. Do not think them. Um, I don't have time. We're not going to go into that today. But just because he's whispering in our ears does not mean we're thinking it. They're not our thoughts. They're not our thoughts. It says, casting down every vain imagination that would exalt itself. We're going to put that under our feet. That is not a thought we are going to think. Amen. When the enemy brings you a thought that you know is a lie... You say, oh, I see that thought. I hear that thought. I know what you're doing. You are a one-trick pony, enemy. <laughs> I don't think he has a really huge bag of tricks. He's just going to use on you the thing he thinks will work. And if you let it work, he'll keep doing it over and over and over and over. So what do we do with captives? You want to take every thought captive? You're going to put it in its cell. Thank you to Jen. She shared this with me. I use it all the time. If you've heard this before, I apologize. So th just imagine your thought is in a cell. You take it out. You interrogate it. If this is a war, this is what we do, would do, correct? I don't know if there's any people here that have served in a war. You're going to interrogate that. Who are you? Where did you come from? Who sent you? What are you doing here? What is your purpose? Are there others? Oh, I know this thought. You've sent it before. Well, that is not going to work on me anymore. You interrogate that till you find out everything you need to know, and you take it out, and you execute it. Yes. <laughs> whoa! Whoa! You don't cower in fear. This is the captive we're talking about here. This is your mind. Take it back. You have the mind of Christ. What is living in there? What is in your mind? What is taking up residence? What is taking up space? I don't know about your mind. Mine doesn't have a lot left in there. Sometimes I think I need all the room I need. I'm like, I can't afford any of these thoughts. So when the shame comes, you know what they did to you? You know how bad you are? You remember that thing? Remember what they did? We wrestle not against flesh and blood people. This isn't about other people. You say, oh, enemy, oh, that thought again. Yeah, so you just want to hurt me again because I know this is like the fourth or fifth time or the hundredth time that you bring, but I'm not thinking it anymore. You can't hurt me. I am hidden with Christ in God. So you want to take this up with Jesus. We are... In Christ, in God. Stop separating yourself out and living outside here and wondering why it's so hard and you're having such a hard time. Get your mind renewed. We have our mind renewed with the truth. And we don't dwell on the lies all the time. I guarantee you, you can just, you can just dilly-dally with those thoughts all you want. Yeah, that was really bad. They really hurt me. It was really horrible. And then that thing happened. And I... A few minutes of that. I can't change my circumstances, but I can be free from their effects. Christ did not come to take away our circumstances. 
Christ came to free us from their power. He knows there's going to be circumstances. I'm sorry that people have hurt you. I'm sorry that people have betrayed you, that people used you and abused you and cast you aside and that you used others and that you lied and you didn't tell the truth. And I get it. But when we come to Christ, that's not how he wants us to stay. I can't change what's happened in my past. But I have experienced healing and freedom from the effects of my past. That is the point of the deliverance and the healing that Jesus came to bring. He does not erase our past. We'll still have the scars. How is this going to happen? Through Holy Spirit. We need to allow him into our lives. We need to understand that he's a living, breathing being. We have to find tools that will help us get free. Some of us can pray and we can be miraculously delivered. Some of us need other tools. Some of the people that come to the Pregnancy Care Center have found hope and healing through some of the programs we offer. We have a program called Steps to Sexual Health, a Christian program that deals with wounding from a past. Anyone who has been in a sexual relationship outside of marriage needs healing. I can say it again. Anyone who has experienced a sexual relationship that has not been within the bonds of covenant marriage, either before marriage or in marriage, can find healing for the thing, because the enemy will use this against us. He will use any of these things to tell us how wrong and broken and bad we are. And Jesus just says, it happened, I'm going to heal you from it and from the effects of it. We have a program called Living in Color. It is for people, primarily women, but anyone, who has experienced the loss of a pregnancy through termination, through abortion. Now, we talk about a lot of terms at the Pregnancy Care Center. We get very used to talking about them. Because, you know, there's not... Some words shouldn't have the power that we give them. The word abortion is a word, actually. And we talk about it all the time because we know it's in life. This is part of people's experience. We never want people to be held back from having open discussions over these things. And so this is why we are here. So if you're a young person that has no one to talk to, or a parent who doesn't know how to bring things up with their kids, or a person who has been coerced or manipulated or is feeling pressured about anything, the center is a safe place. Because we're not at the center trying to make you do or say anything, honestly. We want you to make decisions and walk in health and healing. We want you to make good decisions. We want you to make well-informed decisions. But we do not judge, manipulate, shame, or control. Anyone can come to us. The majority of people who come to us um, are not Christian people. They're looking for help and support because they have no help uh, in their community or in their family. So we need to appropriate Holy Spirit's help. You know, God is looking for partners. God is always healing and always at work and always doing something. <clears throat> if we need some healing, and if you have a hard time, maybe, no, maybe you feel there's something kind of n- not really sitting well, there's something that maybe you feel, well, maybe I would like this to be changed in my life. I'm just not sure what. If you have a really hard time knowing maybe what your struggle could be, if you have anyone you really trust, uh, this is what I had to do. Like, you know, I really think I'm pretty much okay in every area, (laughs) and I wasn't. (laughs) So I asked someone, "Um, if you said there was anything that I might need to work on, what might that be? (laughs) And if they really love you, they might tell you. I'm not telling you to call Pastor Charlotte on Tuesday morning. Not all pastors are there to just counsel you all the time. There are other people perhaps you can go to, other ministries, other areas. 
I'm not saying she's not going to do that. There might be people in your church. I hope there's people in this church that you're accountable, groups that you're involved in that you've built relationship with. You know, you ask most older people and they will probably tell you one thing. If we're truly honest, one of the, I don't believe in regretting things, but I do regret on not getting some of my healing and freedom sooner. If you're raising a young family, I would love you just to let Jesus heal you of your past when you're young and you can just walk in all that assurance of his love in your life. Don't wait till you're like, oh, that's what I was struggling with for so long? Wow. But, you know, we are God's plan for the world. Guys, we are Jesus' plan A. There's no one else. There's no other plan. He's not coming back to do the ministry all over again. He now expects us to appropriate our own ministry that he gives us and things he asks us to do and reach the world. So perhaps he's calling you to do something in your own community. The center relies on volunteers. We are not certified uh, with master's degrees. Uh, we don't make people follow um, months and weeks of program. We don't charge them for things. So one of the ways we keep the budget low is we, we use volunteers. This is also biblical. Jesus says, serve others. So when you go and serve people in whatever capacity, you're just doing what Jesus asked you to, you're gonna get such a blessing in your life. But you're not his servant and you're his friend, you're his partner, you're working together. I would pray that you would certainly keep us in your prayers. I'd like you to visit the table um, and come and talk to us and ask us more questions or sign up for our newsletter. We have exciting things going on. Um, and I know Pastor Charlotte's going to close, but maybe, maybe the team wants to come up and just maybe there's a little music. I just really want you to know, I want you to hear me. You are not alone. You are not alone. None of you are alone. I don't know who's listening online. Maybe you have felt that you have a secret that you've never been able to share with anyone. Uh, we all do. <clears throat> Maybe there's something that you've never been able to verbalize, a pain you've never been able to have resolved. You're not alone. I am truly sorry for the hurts you have experienced in your life. I've discovered through brokenheartedness, I have become a good healer. My brokenness helps other people who are broken. But we don't stay broken. Please allow Holy Spirit to guide you, to talk to you, to draw you to where you could find some healing. If you want to know if the center could be a place for you to volunteer, come and ask us what goes on at the center. Find out what we do and how we help people. If you choose to, to give in some way financially, we'd be so grateful we are a charity. We can give you more information about that. God is doing amazing things in our community. He never stops, but he expects us to partner with him to get that work done. That's how we help the world. We are salt and we are light.